Ray, thanks so much for joining me on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Finally, <laughs> yeah, I know. I was going to say it's years in the making. So <laughs> between one thing or another, it's it's good to get here finally. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I've got a few questions to to kind of get us started. You know, talking about a an age appropriate curriculum. I know a lot of people are are almost going to be starting from scratch when they get back with their teams. Yeah. It could be a new season, whatever we're going to be looking at. But I mean, what is the starting point? when you do get a new team? Well, I think a lot of people's starting point can be, we'll, we'll dive straight in and we, we gather sessions and, and what drills and all this kind of stuff we go do. I think that's kind of the, the go-to phase. Um, what I prefer to do is is kind of zoom out a little bit and, and look at it with a, a bit of a wider lens. Um, f- for me, there's, there's three critical things that are involved in, in working with any group. Um, and that's being age appropriate, um, which I think is is a, a little bit about what we'll talk about um, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, but also being level appropriate and then individual or group appropriate um, to the team that you've got in there. And if you can tick, I guess, those three boxes, um, you've got a really good starting point in terms of, you know, then worrying about getting onto the pitch and, and your sessions and all that sort of stuff. Um, I find it, it it's a really... It's a really funny kind of way because we we forever talk about um, coaches, you know, coaching an adult game to young kids. Um, but I think sometimes as well, we, we can coach quite a kiddie game to, to older teenagers. And I think there's, yeah, for me, the first point number one in, in any coaching um, course or anything like that should be, how do I work with kids of, of a certain age? Or how do, I, how do I work with adults? Or how do I work with, you know, older teenagers? I think doing that first gives you a great platform to to then teach the game. <clears throat> Four moment model there that you, I mean, we've it's pretty prominent, I suppose, in terms of our awareness of it. We all know that what these four moments are. Uh, I suppose the question would be then, how do we move it from theory to practice? I mean, what's some some advice you have for us there? Yeah, I think whenever you do a coaching course, and this this is nothing new, like you say, but. Certainly, over the past few years, I found I found that it's come to life in my own work. I found that you can't um, and by the, the those four corners or, or whatever you want to call them around the world. We're talking the the technical, tactical, uh, the physical, the psychological, and the and the social aspects of of players and teams. Um, I think that's your that's your go to whenever you're selecting a player, judging a player. Um, I think it all goes into into a pot. Um, I think we're we're kind of burdened by commentators sometimes or, or pundits on TV who go, well, this player is X, Y, and Z, and, and that player is good technically, bad tactically, good, good psychologically, or whatever it might be. Um, and we kind of dip in and out of, of player traits. But if you really want to study in a player and you really want to work with players, then you've got to work with them all all, all through those four corners and not sort of give it the lip service when you're in a coaching course and then, and then walk away from it. Yeah, we had Paul McVeigh on here, uh, was it last week or the week before? But he was basically saying, listen, I know you all think that you work on the mental side, but you don't work on the mm. mental side. So, like, I mean, what are... And then, of course, <clears> the <throat> chat room blows up. Well, what are some ways that you... What are sure. different ways to do that? Yeah, for sure. And listen, it's... I've actually been speaking to a, a guy who's an expert on mindfulness this past, uh, well, the past couple of months, but a lot this week. Um, and he talks about his frustration in sort of beating that drum in, in a football environment and not getting anywhere. And it was the same for psychology a few years ago. And I think it comes back down to, I guess, people's fear of it. It's kind of, it's it's an ology, you know, it's mm. it's something scientific and it's something that if I dip my toe into and it's it doesn't work, I'm, I'm doing something wrong or bad. And and really, a part of the work I do around sort of my curriculum development and, and certainly in the new book talks about how do we make psychology easy to deliver and, and not kind of think about psychiatrists and couches and what do you see when I show you this black and white picture mm-hmm. kind of um, idea um, to actually, well, we can work around certain um, psychological characteristics. The one model I use and I constantly go back to is, is, is known as a five C's model. Um, 
Chris Anderson actually did my my A license with with uh, sorry Rich Anderson with with Rich, um, who's one of the authors for that book. And for the first time, I felt with that model, and and you know people like Dan Abrams are excellent, and and some of the other guys are, are really good, but I just find this chunkable. Um, I'll give you I'll give you a wider story. There's Leeds Bradford University did a study with UEFA, and they spoke to basically the who's who of of football development people in Europe, top clubs, top FAs, and they came out with a list of 59 traits that they felt that good players had, psychological traits. Now, if you give me a list of 59 anything, it just looks like a vocabulary lesson. You know, it just looks like an ESOL classroom. Um, and you can't work around 59 things. Um, but what you can do with the five C's model is you can, you can work on commitment and you can work on confidence and, and so on uh, people can, ch can check the model out there's a website i'm not paid any extra for, for prompting it um but it just means that that i can now when i'm building a curriculum and the age appropriate stuff i can include elements of psychology um now you can have a, a lecture or show a video in a classroom or you can just talk to kids on a drinks break about you know what does a committed player look like what does a a confident player do who is a confident player you know whatever that might be no matter what you do you're you're taking it a step closer to to a better place than it was mm. um the, the final thing i would say about psychology is we kind of see it as a you, you work psychologically with someone when they've got a problem you know and we think about i don't want to name these names but you, you we say you're mario balotelli's and stuff mm. like that you know we have to work psychologically with this guy well actually no you know some of the really high performance sports people you talk to johnny wilkinson or, or you know anyone at the, that ilk they work psychologically to improve their already you know outstanding um capabilities in that area so um but we can we can drag it back down to, to our level our age and, and the individuals we work with i think that's a massive point like i see that with same thing with when a player's struggling you bring in if there's no foundation or of psychology if there's not an environment for it to be studied like i've got i i witnessed a psychologist years ago who worked for an nfl team came in with the team and is absolutely polar opposites of the message that the coaching staff were trying to give <laughs> they were telling them the coaching staff were trying to layer on more information more work ethic the psychologist was like hey back off take some breaks so it's you know how how i suppose does a coach is it the planning? Are you asking or, or challenging coaches or advising them to say, when you're planning your session, have that model to where you can actually write things down that you can plan questions after that? For sure, for sure. So, and, and this is like with any long-term plan or any long-term curriculum, you start with a blank page and, and that blank page is quite intimidating. Um, but certainly uh, in, in terms of the way I would work, I would attach, um, psychological traits to the to the sessions we're doing and and you might just drop in little bits here and there um you know we we all think working psychologically with someone is kind of that any given sunday um you know that al pacino speech where it's one moment if i say the right words in the right order with the right tone you know everyone's up and, and we're ready and and that's working psychologically it, it, yeah it is but it's not really what you're doing just like you're doing with any part of football is you're working a little little and often little and often you know the right messages the right lessons just like we do in our football sessions so that in one year two year five years ten years they are better hopefully um in those aspects um so to just sort of rather than let it let it hang out when i'm building a curriculum i, I tend to block off the year so i look at the season and i go right how do i split this up so if i've got 42 weeks i might might work um six blocks of seven weeks um i would do a, an introduction in in the first block around psychology just you know what is commitment what is confidence so on um and then as you go through the season and um, you're dropping in um traits you know smaller zoomed in traits of all those stuff can i, can um, I just can I just stop you there Ray, whenever you're asking them that, does is it have to be a, like a formal classroom setting or these no. things that yeah can just happen informally? 
No, and and listen. By the way, I'm not I'm not a sports psychologist, not at all. I'm I'm probably just like most of the people in in this chat room right now, and and listen to your podcast. That's um, we're amateur psychologists, so we're mm. you know what whatever we're well read or something. Um, the the interventions can be wide ranging. Um, some people don't have the classroom to go to physically. Number one, uh, you know, in a basic term, some people don't have the time or or anything to do, and and some people may not want to bring a bunch of nine year olds into a classroom to talk about mindset or something like that. Um, it can, you know, it can be a a well thought out presentation in that environment, or it simply can be. Do you know what my psychological trait that's on my curriculum tonight is switching on so as as part of concentration we're, we're going to focus on switching on so if one of the players takes a quick free kick or one of the players what whatever notices a something early a quick move or something like that you praise it and you call it out and you say oh you know that's what we were talking about the drinks break that's what i'm talking about being being switched on early when we can uh, if the goalkeeper is picking his nose and, and the ball goes in the nest during your football session, then it's an opportunity to to talk about concentration and being switched on. And it, it just, it's almost not psychology. Everyone, I assume, is, is capable of doing that and, and being a little bit creative around that. And, and suddenly it's not an ology anymore. Suddenly it's it's just, well, I'm working with players around this really quite narrow pinpoint thing. Mm. Yeah, it's it's really really interesting uh, because again that the psychology that we look at is the the Balotelli transferring that to a young player who we're just talking about kids before we started and how mad they were before we started recording. Mm, like, yeah, it's a different yeah. game. So when, when you're looking then at the U10 and you're almost like going back in an age appropriate session design, I mean, what does that look like? What well, from a technical tactical point of view? Yeah, um, yeah. Just for I mean, from the starting point, Ray, where you're sitting down yeah. with a blank piece of paper. Look, I, I think you're you're looking at four or five things with with foundation phase, so that sort of pre pubescent players, um, in, in my opinion. And this is, I believe, this is transferable ar- around the world. If I'm running an academy, these are the things I want to see with with that age group. Um, I want to see, for, so if we go chronologically, I, I want to see the kids doing something when they arrive. So I want to see an arrival activity that's that's doesn't have to be ultra organized. It doesn't have to be, you know, all singing or dancing, but just something for the kids to engage in as a kind of a soft start. I certainly want to see um, a ball mastery, a ball mastery slash 1v1 type work being done. Um, I often compare, I'm trying to learn a language at the minute and it's it's really quite hard as an adult. And I often compare um, ball mastery, um, that the technical part of that to being like learning a language where if, if you can sort of get the nuts and bolts of it, you know, while you're still young, the better chance you have of, of kicking on from that. Um, I'd like to see uh, an, an ABC, um, in terms of their physical stuff, ABCs in terms of the physical stuff. Um, and then I'd, I would like to see some small, if, if small, small side of games make sense. Um, so elements of 3v3, 4v4, or 2v2, or whatever it happens to be with with the group you have on a particular night. You know, anything else after that, if you go into a bigger game because the kids want to play a bigger game, then you, you play the bigger game. Of course you do. That's, you know, that's obvious or, or whatever. Um, and and the 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 op the optional fifth thing is we physically kids lose their flexibility from about ten years of age, um, which when I first heard that didn't quite feel right. It didn't quite mm. sit right. Um, so certainly good habits around maybe cool downs and static stretching and things like that um, can can aid that long term development. Um, and academies I've worked with and and kind of had a an influence on um the, the programs for that age group they were the they were the milestones that were every session every session every week and you know you can you can play with it a little bit as they get older um for sure um but those are the key things that we want to get into players as much as possible before uh, before that kind of puberty phase hits when we see the kid, the coach that's doing laps around the pitch with our u10s 
and we talk about it, we're all like asked at it and we go straight to twitter and rave about it but i mean when you're looking at social at uh, football fitness for that age group or for a young young say how do you incorporate that because you have a chapter on this in your book yeah yeah this is this is the point where kind of sports scientists throw rotten fruit at me and then and, and <laughs> eggs and stuff like that because it's um again i'm just like most people in the room you're, you're probably not an expert um in terms of sports science in terms of fitness um and unlike the psychology aspect if you're not an expert and you're doing fitness work then it's actually quite dangerous you need to know what you're talking about and need to know what you're doing um to me as a football coach uh, and maybe every football coach should be like this maybe there's an argument but i think that your players need to be fit enough to play for 90 minutes for 60 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever it is if you're a young kid you're still learning to move um your energy systems aren't developed so you don't need to do laps of the pitch i don't believe senior pros need to do laps of the pitch certainly not for physical reasons if there's some i don't know some social reasons that, that people use to justify it or psychological reasons that you know senior pros just like to do it it's just mm -hmm. a kind of it's their entrance fee if you like into a session that's that's completely different um but from a physical point of view there's nothing about running laps of a pitch that, that mirrors the game of football um nothing at all in terms of the, the constant running the straight lines the zero impact uh, zero change of direction and things like that it's it's just it would be like you, you wouldn't go and see usain bolt train you would be surprised if you saw him running laps of anything mm what you would expect to see is is probably little bits and i don't know anything about athletics but you would expect him to accelerate decelerate and, and hit top speed as as many times as he could within whatever framework they use um if you were to watch a formula one driver train you would expect him at some point to hit 200 mile an hour you know under time pressure and and so on and so on you know you don't he doesn't train by driving to the airport um you, you know and i know that sounds silly but it's driving but it's not it's not mm. relevant to, to his profession so i think if we could take a step back when we're when we're looking at the physical side of working with players and say what's the game telling us the game's telling us it's multi-directional um you 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 feel contact you get up um you sprint you stop you sprint again you stop you jog a little bit you run a little bit um and, and really you probably spend more time walking mm -hmm. um, than you do sprinting uh, well you do considerably uh, more time walking than sprinting so to me that all adds up well maybe the best thing to develop players in terms of their football fitness is to play football you know an environment where they stand they jump they fall over all that kind of stuff um and you know without being the the sports scientist that's to me the best basis that we can give these players it's interesting because i do think about five years ago ten years ago and i've had a couple of people on the podcast talk about this in that field to be like i know fergus Connolly talks a lot that sports science is over promised and under delivered um i mean there's no way that you need to wire up 12 14 year old kids surely yes uh, you know what i think there's there's a novelty value to it um and certainly the again if we're going back to the to the three things your age appropriate your level appropriate and your individual slash group appropriate you know if you're if you're under 14s are there because they like kicking a ball around and and playing with their pals then no you don't need it whatsoever if they're in a selected environment uh, rather than I, i'm trying not to use the word elite anymore with mm -hmm. kids but if, if they are in a you know an academy or a chosen place and I, I do think there's a place for it because i think there's it's not necessarily about the data it spews up it's about the the habits and, and so on but ultimately um the game the game is so variable that um i i can't have this argument with sports scientists because they can they can talk me under the table in terms of you know whatever degrees they've got in their back pocket and and i work i've worked with loads don't get me wrong um but i just think we forget i, I think we we forget and we overthink it um certain cultures especially 
um, where where the games they have are, are physical based games. Um, Australia, the United States, um, quite a lot as well, where, where games, if you're basketball influence around height and physique and you have your American football influence and so on. Um, and I think, you know, we we go to the fitness corner a little bit too often mm. uh, when things go wrong as well. Because it's a psychological reaction from coaches. <laughs> like it's so easy, yeah, maybe. you know, put the, keep the bag because it's almost used as talk about the psychological and the incorporating the four corners. Sometimes we do it as coaches when we're annoyed. So it's easy mm. to threaten and fear. Well, the balls will be in the bag. He's a run today. Yeah, uh, I mean, does that ever work when you play? Never, never work at any know. age group. Players or yeah. coaches. Um, a last couple for me, Ray, and then I'll, I'll uh, open it up. If you want to start throwing the questions here, uh, go on ahead. Uh, the the curriculum where when you're designing that curriculum and obviously you want to play a, a possession game, how do you design a curriculum without being generic where it looks like a camp curriculum that we looked at 15 mm -hmm. years ago? Yeah, no, I think it's... And again, it's it's it'll all be age appropriate and, and, and so on. But it's um and it, it's difficult to to give it a context because there's there's so many variables, I guess. Um, now, if you're talking about playing a possession game with youth teams, that, that's great. There's real real value in in that in terms of youth development. I think having a philosophy as a coach is great for that kind of thing. But I also think there's um you're duty bound to, to teach the wider game well so if you if you want to coach a pressing team in a, in a pressing way i still think you need to coach deep defending at some point because the, the players if they're going to come out of your system at 18 year your club or whatever at 18 years of age they need to be you know they need to have the tool bag quite full um, and that doesn't mean bouncing around trying to figure out every different tactic or anything like that but but certainly just like you would expect in school you you would narrow in and focus on certain things for sure, um. But you would certainly hit the the wider breadth of of the game as well. I spoke to Chris Ramsey actually from a book. If people who don't know Chris, he's he's kind of one of the best known, unheard of coaches in in many ways. He's worked at Tottenham and he's he's now then a QPR. Um. We we look at Barcelona the same. We look at Ajax and they play the same way from their kids up to their first team and they're built on that and they're proud of that but then Dennis Bergkamp leaves Ajax and he can't play for Inter Milan he, he goes there for multi-million euros or whatever pounds or whatever it was at the time or lira or whatever and he can't play for Inter Milan um, now is there a case where we say well actually Barcelona are developing players for Barcelona what are we developing players for? Are we developing? Chris was like, I'm not developing players for QPR necessarily. I'm developing players for the game of football, the wider game of football. Um, and therefore, there's, there's kind of a move away from that constant philosophy, um, playing philosophy, certainly. But it's it's complicated, but I thought it was an interesting point. Hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um... And then the last one for you, I've got, and then we'll, we've got the questions are flying in here. So, a uh, deliberate practice. And this, again, what, what's the starting point for it? How do you, something that we, we know a little bit about as coaches, but how do you mm. put it into action? Uh, I, I would actually reverse it a little bit and, and, and I never do this. I, I tend to talk about what not to do. So the, the warning signs of, um, of, of coaching in a non-deliberate way, we'll say, are straight lines and, and kind of scripted movements and things like that. So players queuing for things, players having to stand on one cone to move to another cone, those constant practices um, kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's your big red flag. If, if that's your go-to in your sessions, I, I really want you to think deeper about, about um, what, again, what the game is telling us. It's, it's more variable than that. It's more unpredictable than that. We moan and we moan and we moan about players who can't make decisions you know he's great in training but he can't do it on saturday you know how many times do we hear that and you know maybe there's a reason for that maybe they're being told where to pass where to move and and all that sort of stuff on a you know pass and follow your pass every night of the week uh, and then saturday it's it's messier than that that's you know when when in, in a way we're not teaching them the game and and again that's that's kind of some people will throw fruit at me for saying that but 
it's it's the it's the truth and it's something i stand by with with a huge amount of conviction um and the more we can drag our practices closer to the game and it doesn't mean just playing games all the time but the more we can look at the game and say what is it telling us the, the better do i have time to give you a quick example absolutely yeah yeah so if i'm uh, if we look at and i don't like uh, coaching technical stuff so but let's say we're we, we want to do some shooting with with the players right now the, the traditional way was 20 of you in a line you know go fetch you have a shot go fetch your ball mm-hmm. and, and all that sort of stuff yeah and you know for for most of your session you know 19 kids are not practicing anything at all other than standing in a queue um we know that um but it's coach was to say but it's still shooting and we go well it's not it's kind of kicking a ball towards goal because if if this was game related we we wouldn't shoot from outside the box if we're in a 1v1 situation we we make a different decision um in fact 80 to 90 percent of goals are scored inside the penalty area and they're scored under time pressure and under pressure from opponents so again what what exactly are we practicing we're practicing this kind of event that happens maybe one to five percent of the time successfully or are we going to get in and practice shooting where we're under pressure where we've got limited time where we have defenders in a way teammates in the way or teammates as options goalkeepers you know if you're and we've all we've all had this feeling where the ball has landed at our feet in the box and through all the madness you see a, a little bit of the net you just see a little bit of a path between you the ball and that net and, and that's what we need to we don't have to coach it we just have to set up situations where kids and players are practicing those skills as much as possible mm. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, a couple of questions here that are flying in. Hannah Duncan, Hannah's at uh, almost every one of these events. She asked a really good question, so I'm going to go to her first. Hi, Ray, may U13 grassroots girls team are progressing to 11 a side next season. Some of the girls are playing a year up as well. What would you consider the most important aspects to work on pre-season, assuming we get one? Uh, we've got <laughs> one hour of training a week. Right. I mean, look, you've... It, let's let's put a pin in the whole you know whenever we get there whenever we get back on the pitch let's just assume you know we'll we'll, we'll try park it a little bit um the and i'm going to put my fa hat on here now a little bit because and and this goes for associations around the world when they build into a league system we'll, we'll say five aside seven aside nine aside eleven aside the, the, there's pretty clever people at the top of the tree that are making those decisions based on the age of those kids. And they're saying when they get to under 13, in, in this case, then that should be their first taste of 11 v 11. So that league, you're under 13, probably the first half of your season, it is your practice, first of all. That's your practice of 11 v 11. And, and everyone's in the same boat. We have this, there's a tendency around this age group to... to 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 want to get there quicker or we're playing 11 v 11 in six months time i need friendlies i need to do this we need to be training towards 11 v 11. i don't think you need to panic i actually think if you're focused on the long-term development of the players them transferring from 9 v 9 to 11 v 11 at that age group is actually part of their long-term development it just happens to be implemented by by the fa Uh, in that way i probably don't have to answer you you know i've got an hour a week you know kind of question in terms of 11 v 11 via those kids for an hour a week which is is not a lot um you know what we can't teach everything do we go in with a complete game-based way of playing or sorry a way of training um where we're maximizing the time for them to get better within that that really small window of time um so i, I hope it, i kind of didn't answer the question but it, it, it does help answer it in, in a roundabout sort of way Mm. Craig Scott has asked, speaking about making the most of time, Craig's asked about whenever you're going into, again, the reality of coaching, when you're going on a 4G pitch and you've only got this window of an hour, uh, how do you engage and arrive at activities while setting up the session? Uh, anything quickly that can kind of get them going? Yeah, I mean, I've I've got a mentee who's, he's got that situation and he, he works out, he's got about 45 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes with, with the kids once a week. Uh, because of that change over time and all that and he needs time to set up and all this sort of stuff your arrival activity can be four cones 
you know, forget about setting up something from from a an airport runway. You know, four four cones gives you a nice little playing area. And if every kid can can come into to your field, take a ball out your bag and head towards that area, um, where they do some ball mastery, where they do some twists and turns, or maybe there's a small bazooka goal in there as well. I I, I can't kind of give you this the session and, and and freshen that session up time and time again. You could even say to kids of of any age group, hey Gary. Here's the four, four cones. Would you go set up our arrival activities area? Um, and maybe you leave. You could leave a laminated A4 piece of paper in that area to to kind of guide them through whatever arrival activity it is. Maybe it's maybe it's a three v three game, or maybe it starts two v two, three v three, four v four, five v four until everyone's there and, and they're playing six v six or something in a really small area. To me, that's that's fantastic, and the kids will run in the gate, and the kids will be there earlier every week uh, to get in and do that um you know rather than option b often being do what you want or option c let's just stand around and don't touch the balls um we with that same mentee we actually layered um his arrival activity his when we relate back to our earlier discussion about foundation phase sessions so in the same kind of 15 minute period he does an arrival activity, a ball mastery, a little bit of one v one, and and his ABCs is all is all involved in that um, in that segment of the session, and it's kind of like it, we always call it Tokyo because it's you're you're building up rather than out, and and you're using that time, um, and and this guy is he's a good guy, he's a level one coach, he's not you know he's not. Um, a professional for years and years but he he was able to do that and, and he, he does do that now every week we've got pete good question this one is u13 coming season would you agree that all of their physical development should be done within the session rather than specific fitness work or does there need to be a time when pure physical exercises are necessary um i, I would i could answer the health issue and again this comes down to what level and, and what it is with the group maybe it's a, a dare i say a, an, an overweight player or or something like that um that needs kind of some lifestyle guidance or whatever and, and that's maybe i shouldn't have even opened that kind of worms but that's um you know maybe a wider responsibility than just a football coach but off the bat Forget about isolated fitness work. Forget about isolated fitness work in three or four years as well. Just just get them on the pitch. Get them with the balls. Um, that's what they're there for. That's what will get them fit for your game on Saturday. Um, and that's what will keep them coming back. Well, just on this here, uh, a question from uh, Long Lee as well. And I think it's just because he's asked about the with pre-season around the corner, how does pre-season typically look for youth development phase? But when we get back, we're going to have all these coaches freaking out because they missed two months, three months of soccer with the youth yeah. levels worried about, I mean, how do you incorporate that and, and balance that? I'm actually really quite worried about what happens when we do go back. Um, we, we'll go back and we need to, we need to widen this lens a little bit and, and think about, well, when the players go back, they cannot wait to get back on your training pitch. They cannot wait to be back with their mates, with the footballs out and, and senior pros will be the same. Uh, Liverpool's first team will be dying to get back out onto that football pitch with with their pals, um, and we're some very well intentioned coaches will wreck that, mm. and we'll wreck that quite quickly because we need to do hill runs, we need to do sprints, we need to do suicides or go all Coach Carter in in that first couple of weeks. We need to be fitter. We need to get back. You know, don't kill it. Get get the balls out. Get the games going. Um, you know, and work your way. Pre-season it has changed a lot. It's changed from this physical-only segment of your season to to probably in that older phase, a more tactical one. So, can we get our game model sorted for the coming season and, and pin down certain whatever tactical ideas and stuff like that? The fitness stuff is is absorbed within all that. Um, those that have read sort of the tactical periodization stuff will. Uh, we'll probably have a head start in in that sort of way um but yeah please when you go back you for me you're working in the social corner when we get back from all this primarily uh, and that is a bit of the irish in me a bit of crack 
a bit of fun, get the balls out, get them playing, um, and and working in a sort of a little and often way towards physical fitness because um, every, everyone's in the same boat anyway. And they, sorry, last thing, they will get injured if you if you run them up and down and and you beast them, they will get injured. Brilliant. Yeah, on that social corner, a couple of people have asked about dealing with you know the discipline. How do you handle a problem troublemaker on the team at that young age? At what age is that? Well, no one's asked the age, but I'm going to ask the age because I'm really fast. <laughs> uh, say say you 13, you 12. You know, before the jump in your car and go home age, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and that, that age group is, is an awkward one. It's a really awkward one, actually, because it's one of those stages. We were talking about the terrible twos before mm. we, we come on air, but it's one of those stages in life where there's a cry for more independence um so they're, they're in secondary school or they're in high school and they're not reliant on mum and dad anymore they have their phones they they can go out and you know do stuff socially that's they don't need a lift to anymore and all that kind of stuff so they're, they're crying for independence the result is they get in your face more that that lovely 10 year old you had a couple of years ago is now a bit of a you know i don't know what the right word is in this in this environment but he's just changed um and and often from our point of view can become a little bit dislikable uh, around that age and if you speak to high school teachers or secondary school teachers they will tell you that their hardest job behavior wise is within that group now if you want to throw puberty into all that we're not talking about football we haven't spoke about football yet but if you throw puberty into that, you throw growth spurts into that, you throw all the things that come with, with that environment, you know, frankly, what do you expect to happen at some point? Now, for me, as a, as a discipline kind of uh, way of dealing with them, I always circle back to the deliberate soccer practice stuff in, that, in terms of if you queue them up and you bore them, you're going to have trouble or you're going to have a greater chance of trouble than if they're constantly physically, I always say physically and mentally engaged in what they're doing and um, whether that's a game or just something that they're thinking about. If you're setting up one part of the session while the other part of the session is going on, they'll start to play you up because, you know, you, it comes across as being ill prepared and, and whatnot. So if you can get there, if you can be really organized, if you can keep them I won't use the word entertain because we're not circus clowns, but if you can keep them busy um, and, and consider all the other puberty stuff and all the other stuff that's going on in life, then I think maybe you've just got a better start point and maybe you just don't have to deal with so much of the, the, the disruptive stuff after. Hmm. Bill Beswick once, uh, I always remember, it was at the convention over here when he sees di uh, difficult players, coaching difficult players was topic. And uh, his first thing he said, everyone with the notepads out, first thing he said was, if the coaching is not right, every player will be difficult. And I was like, oh, yeah, really, really good way yeah. to put it. And you can see where he's coming from. And, and he's, he, he's, got, he's got a bank to, he's able to, uh, look, Bill has is, is, is worked with in, nearly in every sport and, and at every level kind of thing. So he is a, he's a fantastic way of, of getting to the simplicity of it all. Um, but you know he's absolutely right. If you, if you can if you can get those organisational bits done before you get on the pitch at all, um, and you know what another thing, if you're sometimes you're 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 ready for the punch up, yeah, you know by punch up the conflict. Sometimes you go into things ready for a fallout, um, and and I think that's that's quite a, a poor way to prepare as well. It's easy to do because you, you kind of feel it coming. But if you feel it coming, then you, your fuse is shorter and you react stronger and you react earlier than, than probably you would have done before. Um, you know, so again, widening that lens a little bit, uh, understanding what's going on around it and keeping them busy. Um, it, it doesn't eliminate it, of course it doesn't. Um, but it, it you know, just might make it a lot more manageable. Yeah, we had uh, Martin O'Neill mentioned about when we had him on a few months, a couple of weeks ago, whatever. Uh, Com competing teaching young players to compete and max has just asked the question there about how much how much should competition be incorporated in each age group or should you layer that into your your sessions or your your curriculum uh, are you talk that now there's two very different questions there if you're talking about competition as in on a saturday and having to win or are you talking about 
you know, first team to five wins your training game kind of thing. Because I, I do think there's a big difference. Yeah, I'm not, well, I mean, I'm, I think it's... Well, let me do both. Yeah, look at both, yeah. I mean, I in my deliberate soccer practice books, we there's, there's always a section on how do you score um, and, and, and making our football sessions competitive. It adds, to me, it adds greater value. Kids like it, adults like it. If, if me, you and, and eight other um, people from this from this podcast go to play a game a five aside, we will get the score. And if it gets, you know, if it gets uncompetitive, we change the teams and all that sort of stuff. So having a score, it, it lights a fire under people. But there's an age appropriate and level appropriate way to do it. Um, and if we carry that into a Saturday where you have to win, where it's it's win or bust um, mentality, that transmits to the kids, but it affects our decision making as well. And that's when we pick the bigger players. That's when we pick the, the quickest players and the poorest tactics and the long ball and the no risk and the no creativity and all that kind of stuff comes in. Um, so I would say, a, a, I'll say a huge amount of competition in your sessions in a in a child friendly sort of way. Um, first to fives or whatever it might be, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, the time limits, anything like that is great because it gets a little extra ounce, I believe, out of players. Um, but you know, be very, very careful about taking that to the weekend into your games program, and and you know, put that winning into context. I guess. Chris McLaughlin has asked uh, if you were to go into a relatively successful but underachieving adult team as a head coach, how would you go about making your first impression? Stand back and assess, or ball in a china shop? Can you please say ball in a china shop? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, do you know what my? Um, my style, I guess, uh, my way, uh, and maybe everyone's different to this, my way would always be to stand back and have a look and, and get a clear picture of what's going on. Um, I, I always think in, in those, especially in an adult environment, there's kind of a power thing happening as well. Um, so I think I think you've really got to, to analyse very carefully what you're going into, um, identifying why. I think they were good traditionally, but underachieving. Was that the... That the the way I don't, kind of read between the lines of whether he's talking about his team or, or the team he supports or whatever. Um, the bull at the, uh, the bull in the China shop that wears off, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's, Oh, here, here's, here's a manager come in again, you know, melting off and, and doing all that. And that wears off very, very quickly. Um, whereas I think if you're rational and you step back and you look at it, I just think you make better decisions and, and people relate to you better. Um, but the, the, there'll always be the, the outlier that worked, right? Yeah, well, if you've got the energy to be the ball for four years, then you can do it. But uh, Sarah... Well, I think I'm just... Sorry, you mentioned... Sorry, Gary, you mentioned Martin O'Neill there a few minutes ago mm. and I'm listening to him speak about um, Brian Clough. Mm. Um, and, you know, Brian Clough was a very clever guy as well as being a bull at times, but he, he, he went into Leeds as, as the ball um very much so as the as the bull in the china shop and you know there was you know if anyone could have done it at the time you would have thought it would be him um but it's you know you you stick your neck out pretty pretty far and i don't think there's a way back if it goes wrong oh like it, it's a it's a heavyweight type of fight match especially with senior players that if you know if you're going swinging haymakers they've you know, senior players can work situations and they can throw them as well. So who gets Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Sarah, Sarah's asked a really good one here about, um, we hear quite often about how do you deal with varying ability uh, in, the, in the certain age group with how do you, you know, not risking frustrating the top players and how, how do you yeah. manage that? Yeah, it's, first of all, every, every team in the world has a, has a top, mm-hmm. middle and bottom. Now, now some teams have a bigger gap in between, um, f- for sure, and, and and it's it is probably the million dollar question I think in in youth football, um, in youth soccer, and it's probably not a one size fits all as an answer to to give Sarah. Um, what I would suggest is, I found myself doing this actually a number of years ago, where I spent all my time trying to make the and I mean this in the nicest possible way, the bottom ones better. So I was trying to take the bottom ones up to a level where we were all as kind of the same as possible. Um, 
and completely neglected um, the, the top end and completely lacked the challenge for the top end. And, and that might sound morally a bit better than, than focusing on the top end. But I think you've got to, you've got to um, have a wide sweep across the group. So to, to answer the question on the training pitch, a lot of the things we would do if, if we were doing underload or overload games, for example, the, the better players will be underloaded. Now, you've got to be a little bit creative in how you do this because uh, they, they figure out pretty quickly what you are doing. Um, but you give the, the poorer players um, the, the comfort, I guess, or the crutch of playing with, with greater numbers. Um, but you also give them the challenge of playing against the better players. So I think there's kind of a, like a balance to be struck with that. Um, our tendency when we coach, let's say we're, we're doing, for argument's sake, we're doing 2v1s. Our tendency is for me and you, Gary, to play against John, and then me and John play against you, and then you and John play against me, and everything's fair. Mm -hmm. and we do it all for two minutes, and, and off we go. Whereas I think what we really want to do is, because John is so much better than me and you, we want to give him more time as the one and give us, me and you, because we're struggling, we want to give us more time as, as the two because that, that's where our level's been pitched. Um, and you can always play around with that and, and make it work and use floaters and all those kind of things. Um, but, but, you know, working solely within one group or the other, you kind of end up doing neither. We've got Pete, who's, um, he's kindly said that he's read both books, so... Uh... He must work for Banyan Kearney. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you could, Ray, if you could offer uh, one line to sum up youth coaching, what would it be? I suppose if we could one one piece of advice for a youth coach. Do you know what, Gary? I think your your tweets are far better at this than than, <laughs> than I will ever be in terms of those one liners. I'm I'm not a very one liner kind of guy. Um, I, I I don't know. I generally don't know where to start. To be honest with you. This will sound awfully boring and, and nothing like those lovely quips you have on your Twitter feed, but you, you're you're looking at you're looking at the four corners. That's your player, mm. and it, it's a miss. It's a complete mismatch of, of all of those influences, uh, for better or worse. Um, you know, that's that's every player you'll ever work with. Well, I'm. Oh, do you know what? I've got a better yeah, one. I've got a ahead, better one. Ahead, yeah. I've got a better one. Oh. And I should have thought of this straight away. Uh, my good friend Kim Paulson, who who I worked with in Africa, and he works for FIFA. He he said to me at dinner one night. He said, "Ray, no matter what, find them where they are and take them from there." And that was the, I don't I can't believe I didn't think of that first because he's absolutely right. If you can, um, rather than going in there with your expectations and your level and your ideas you need to go in there whether it's a coach you're mentoring or players and um, find them where they are and, and starting their journey from where they are brilliant that's better that's very good very good um yeah. i'll just edit this when it goes back Do, yeah you uh, can clip the last bit yeah <laughs> uh i was i was actually looking down because when you're talking about the starting point for the player uh, and i can't for there's so many questions i've lost that someone's asked about you know, with these curriculums how do you get that still that individual piece of the player yeah for sure and that's the that's the bit that when i'm doing these for coaches that's kind of the bit i can't give i can kind of build a system to allow it to happen and um, you know i it was funny because i was listening to uh, an audiobook uh, called the manager i think it's called mm. well they, they spoke about neil warnock working with adele terapt uh, for qpr and what a special case he was in terms of his ability, but also in terms of his, his mentality was, was a difficult one. And, and some of the brilliant strategies he used to, to work around um, players like that. So I'm a keen, keen um, worker on, on individuals. Um, when I'm working with a team, it doesn't matter what level or where they are, um, we will sit down every six, seven, 10, 12 weeks, whatever, depending on their age and their level and and look at their game so let's say uh, let's say tomorrow night gary we're working on playing out from the back for argument's sake well the goalkeeper he's got his individual plan so maybe it's about his maybe one of them is his distribution or he's th throwing the ball in with a certain technique or something like that we can still within playing playing out from the back zoom in on that the striker about his pressing um the midfielder about his um 
playing the ball quicker or open body shape. So all those little elements can still exist and do still exist in the game all the time. So the, the closer your sessions are to the game of football, the more you can work with those individuals around their program. Um, we would do a small sided game. Um, so let's say it's an 8v8 for, for argument's sake, where we have six. So instead of everyone being on two touch or everyone having to, you know, score with one touch or whatever the, the conditions are, we would actually have 16 different conditions uh, rules going on at the same time so you might be on two touch Gary because part of your program is to move the ball quicker um, I might be talking about my 1v1 defending and, and all sorts of, but there the only thing that can facilitate all that happening is you playing the game Brilliant. last couple here um, this has flown by That's it. Lewis Fre Fried has asked about can we all agree that many heads, i.e. coaches, player, club players, are better than one? So basically, how do you take advantage of synergies between getting, in this curriculum, getting the parents bought in, the coaching staff bought in, mm. uh, directors, et cetera? Yeah, that's your, that's your biggest challenge, I think. If I, I've done a lot of curricula for whole clubs. Um, and... It, in this modern world, top-down messages, expecting top-down messages to be followed is very, very difficult. I think you need a certain amount of, um, you either need to be able to persuade people very, very well, or you need to involve them in the process. Mm -hmm. um, so I think involving them in the process is 100% the best way of doing it. So for example, if I'm doing a, a whole club curriculum, let's say it's from eight to 18 for argument's sake, the the outlier in all of that is can your coaches tell me about their team or their players or their style or, or whatever it is. And, and what we do is we kind of have this morphing um, between the, the overall philosophy of the club and, and the individual um, traits of the, the, the players teams. It's, it's not easy. It's not a hundred percent. It is, dare I say it is a working document. And, and what I eventually want from coaches is to use that document and be good enough to tweak them. So when you started coaching Gary, you found a session from a good coach and you put that exact session on for your players. But now you're a better coach, you see the session, you go, well, actually I'd do this or I'd make the area smaller or I'd do all that. It's the same in essence with the curriculum whereby you work in it for some time, you get used to it and then you start to explore it and then you start to, to make use of, of the intricacies with it. With parents, there, there's a kind of a black and white I find with parents where some coaches will say, you need to engage them every day of the week. They need to be absolutely involved in everything. And you have the other guys who say, no chance, don't even talk to them, uh, I'm not interested. And nobody wins that punch up. My advice in terms of working with parents is, I, I, I like to speak to parents early I'd like to tell them what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Um, a, because I like them to hold me to it. So if I say I'm going to rotate positions of, of your boy every six weeks or something like that, then but if week seven, I haven't done it, I'm quite happy if someone tells me. Um, so there's that accountability also. But I don't want to be dealing with problems because I've changed the kid position. Or I don't want to be dealing with problems because we lost the game or we lost two games because we played out from the back or you know we're dribbling too much or you know all that stuff that kind of gets in the way of, of parents and winning and last thing on the parents and, and as a parent i love when leaders in any place teachers in school sports clubs hobbies whatever i love when they take an interest in my kid i, I love when they um give me feedback I, I love when you know that's it's the best feeling in the world when when you um, when all you want is to send your kids somewhere where they're, they're they're going to be good and they're going to enjoy themselves and they're going to be treated well, so why not do more of that? You know, and, and if that's if you can build that into your program as well, where you are, especially with WhatsApp messages and stuff like that now. Um, if you, if you went on a bit of a cycle around your parents just to say, you know, hey Gary, listen, Gary's done really well the last few weeks. He's been working on his dribbling and he's he's been really good. You know, or anything like that or. Jimmy's been off the last few weeks. Is everything okay? Is there anything I can do? It's, you know, it's 20 years ago that was difficult, but today we could do that in an evening. 
um, with our phone in our hand. So um, I've kind of digressed a little bit from the, the question, but um, that, that parent relationship is, is a really, really important one. Um, they're, they're the biggest stakeholder in that kid's life, uh, generally, uh, you know, you'd hope anyway. Um, you know, we're, we've only got custody of them for a couple of hours a week. Um, so having that communication, but being allowed to do our work is really, really a really important balance. Yeah, even on that, we talked about that behavior before. Like I had, like I, I went to pick up the wee man whenever the school was open a couple, few months ago and the teacher, three years old, so like he, they're not doing anything, but she said, well, he had a bit of a tough day today and he's had a bit of a tough week as well. And um, it was so impactful for me. I never, I never thought I would have been impacted by someone actually taking the time to tell me that, hey, it looks like, it's almost emotional, you know, it's always, it looks like your little man's struggling. So when I thought of that there, I was thinking, oh, God, why was I not? I've missed a beat here for 10 years, not been thinking of it. Yeah, we, we, look, we talk about social corner, this and psychological that and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the the connection that you can build with people by just taking a small bit of time out just to do that is, is massive. And in many ways, it, it lends itself to the football stuff because you now, Gary, would, would do anything that teacher asks of you. Uh, and, and you you trust that teacher to uh, I, I don't know if the the analogy is quite the same but you would trust that teacher no matter what idea they had for in terms of your kid um in terms of the, his development we'll say uh, at that particular age in, in school or education or whatever environment that is um but you'd you'd sooner go along with it than than sometimes it's just like speaking to a stranger which i think is is not great and listen don't get me wrong the last thing you want either is an open forum for parents you know you know every day of the week i think you should do this you should do that if if you get a culture of that where the parents are like the kind of the sailors are running the ship mm. you know that's that's the toughest place to be in youth football i i think i believe and um, you don't want that you you certainly want to be in in control of your your remit and your zone um and I always think getting them, giving them early messages on your terms where they're replying to you <laughs> rather than you replying to them. Mm, brilliant. Last one for you. And it's, uh, this is from me, basically, uh, for, I mean, there's a lot of reading until you mentioned the manager and there's some unbelievable books. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at, and, and you are allowed to plug your own here. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> what, what do you want me to say? But when you're looking at uh, youth, I mean, there's like what what reading can you point people towards in that time, this time to get youth coaches a little bit more information? Yeah, I mean, the and I, I do mean this sincerely. When I sat down to to write making the ball roll, um, it's it's going back seven years ago now. When I started putting pen to paper, it was it was kind of like I, I wanted it to be a go to place for for coaches to to pick up um, and read about all those things we spoke about today. Um, technical training, tactical stuff, all four corners, psychology, leadership, all that sort of stuff. And coaching youth football, which came out um, about a month or two ago now, um, was the kind of the the um, the sequel, if you like, to that. Um, so the, to, to me, as if you wanted a, a go-to resource, they're your ones. But, but throughout those books, those books come from me quoting and referencing a lot of books, but whether that's genuinely from, from your stuff. Um, I read a brilliant book last year by Ben Littleton called Edge. Um, it, it's more of a professional game, but I just found myself just absorbing more and more from it. Um, the, the, the manager was very good. I constantly talk about uh, the talent code. I recently read Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is, I don't think it mentions football or soccer whatsoever through it, but it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a bit of a, bit of a game changer in, in terms of, of, I don't know, the, the information you retain. There's, there's, there's psychology books. There's, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd struggle to pick out a top five legacy leadership, all those kind of things. Um, I like my ones because they're all all that info's in the one place. And and let me let me ask you this: and once they're going through the reading, there's also time. I mean, everyone's chomping at the bit to get back. What would you recommend coaches kind of work on now when they're away from their team at the youth level? What I did that was really really beneficial. Um, it was actually a having having read uh, Atomic Habits. I downloaded a, a habit app. 
and you could easily do this on on pen and paper, but you know you need an app for it. Uh, yeah, and 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 I populated the app with the habits that I wanted to develop, um, and that was yeah. I, I study coaches, but when and where I kind of do a little bit of everything. So it's in my habit that whatever it is, twice every five days that I was zooming in on one particular coach and I was zooming in on them by reading an article and watching a video. That was the minimum. Uh, and what, what I've found happens when you, when you put down your habit stuff, not just in football, but in life, you actually filter out what's unimportant and, and you filter in what is really important. So I'm watching kind of X amount of Ted talks a week. Um, you know, I'm reading X amount of physical books as well because of, of, often you get caught in your phone and your, your Kindle and so on. Um, and I often feel guilty about that. I'm learning a language which I've wanted to do for 15 years but never kind of got the impetus to, to do it. Um, so really at this moment, and I'm not one to give advice about the wider world at this moment. We, we all just have to survive. That's objective number one. Um, but I found really, really helpful is just to try zoom in on, on what it is you want to improve. Um, James Clear, uh, I've promoted him more than I've promoted my books, I think, but he, he, he dropped a tweet out and he said, what can you do from your bucket list while you're in isolation? And I just thought, what a wonderful, you can't answer it straight away, but it's just a wonderful thought to, to drop in there. Uh, and again, it brings out what's really important to you um so that's that's something that stayed with me and I've, I've been busy because of it and i've thoroughly enjoyed that sounds madness but i've thoroughly enjoyed this kind of headspace mm -hmm. i guess and i know a lot of people are going through some awful stuff and it's you know it's i'm not at all um trying to benefit from it or anything like that but um you know you play the hand you dealt sometimes i guess um and I've, you know, I've been quite busy with podcasts and webinars and all that sort of stuff. So it's, there's loads out there, to be fair as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. Great way to finish it. Been... Ray, thank you so much. This has been brilliant. Um, we'll get you on again if this thing continues and we're off again and, and we're around. I'm sure there'll be round two of this will be requested. Yeah, listen, you, you know where I am. And uh, I think it's uh, London buses, as they say, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Top class. Hi. Uh, All right, mate. All the best to you and the family, Ray. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you too, Gary. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.